It's Brett, and welcome to FNW Stories Episode 5, where today I'll be going over FNW's top rival, the Wing Promotion. Now, a lot of information I'm going to be going over today is from the Wing book that was released in 2021 by Kazuhiro Kojima. He did a great job of interviewing multiple people in Wing to be able to write about the entire history of the promotion, compared to the FNW book that he wrote last year, which only covered the first two years. So there's going to be a lot more information here and stories not well known that I'm going to be going over in this episode. So when you talk about Wing, the first person you have to mention is the founder and president, Mickey Ibaragi. Now, I talked about it last episode, how he worked for FNW the first year as he was in the office working on the videos and getting the foreigners booked. Well, I talked about it last episode as well, how he and Onita always had issues right away as Ibaragi was naming all the FMW videos in English, and then Onita didn't like that Ibaragi was taking all the money that came from the videos, which Ibaragi admits he was doing, but says that it was his video company and it was part of the deal that was made because FMW at the beginning was a poor company and could not pay Ibaragi that much. Ibaragi also stopped showing up to the FNW office because he had heard Onita was going to fire him and he would rather just stop showing up than be called into a meeting and then be fired by Onita personally. Another thing I talked about last episode was how Ibaragi was also upset that everyone in the office were getting a raise following FNW's rise from after doing the exploding barbed wire death match in August 1990 which was distributed by Ibaragi's video company. Everyone got a raise except Ibaragi. Ibaragi would get told that he was not getting a raise, even though Shoichi Arai, who was in the same position as him at the time, was getting a raise. Ibaragi would end up going to a reporter and complain about not getting that raise, and the reporter would go up to Onita and ask him about it, with Onita going, Please understand, to grow a company, there are sacrifices that have to be made. But it's pretty apparent Onita was just done with Ibaragi at this point because of the video distribution money dispute they were having with Onita feeling like I Ibaragi was taking all the video money and he shouldn't be. So Ibaragi quits in March 1991 and then FNW ring announcer Taui Tayo and FNW referee Masasugu Kawanami, they would decide that they're going to quit FNW a couple months after that and join up with Ibaragi in starting up a new wrestling promotion. Mr. Pogo also knows he's going to be leaving FMW to join up with them before doing a landmine death match on May 6, 1991 against Onita. And then he would end up quitting after doing this big hot angle where he acts like he's going to be a baby face for FMW before turning on Onita and throwing a fireball at his face. The plan was for this new promotion to have Mr. Pogo be their top wrestler. But he's a heel, so they need a top face. And they decide that top face is going to be... Mitsuturu Takuda, who had wrestled in FNW for a little bit that first year before disappearing, so he's not that well known. And already everyone besides Ibaragi is like, why is this guy going to be the top babyface ace? The reason was simply because he was the first guy to join the promotion besides Pogo, and Ibaragi thought he had potential since he had a judo background. Ibaragi then happened to run into Kazuyoshi Osako, who was the guy that had helped financially start up FMW for Onita and was the president of FMW that first year until Onita fired him after Osako wanted his wife, who was over accounting, to get a raise. So they had worked in the FNW office together, but they didn't really know each other. So Asako, knowing Ibaragi has left FMW to form this new promotion, wants to work together. Ibaragi doesn't really want to, though, since Osako's vision was more about martial arts than pro wrestling. But Osako had the money to start up this new company, so Ibaragi agrees to partner up with him to create a new promotion called Wing. 
So it would not come out until the day before that FMW was about to start their June 1991 tour that Mr. Pogo would let FMW know that he was leaving. So he was on all these lineups for all these shows that he'd be main evading in tag matches against Onita. So it was very late that FMW would find out that he wasn't going to be on these shows. And even when he got removed from the lineups, the fans would just think it was a work and Pogo would end up showing up at the end of the show and attack Onita since Pogo was probably hotter than he had been his whole 20 year career at this point after having the landmine deathmatch and then blowing fire in Onita's face the month prior. But the way Pogo left would look real bad and people would think Pogo was very dishonest about leaving FNW. Although Pogo would just say, hey, I was never a contracted FNW wrestler and that he worked for the company Capital Sports Promotion, which was ran by Victor Quinones, and they had decided that they were going to end their working relationship with FNW and begin working with Wing instead. So originally, Ibaragi wanted to name Wing WWWING, with the three W's standing for winning, wrestling, and worlding. And then he would have a star after the three W's and before the ING at the end of it. Well, he would get in contact with some poster companies to make posters for the upcoming house shows. And they had to have wrestling on the posters written on it so people outside of Tokyo would even know what these posters were promoting. And the poster company would think this is just too many characters on the poster. And so they would just make it wing wrestling. And Ibaragi would see that and go, eh, this looks better. Let's just go with that instead. There would also be jokes inside the wrestling business about how the only real star in Wing would be in its name because none of the wrestlers on the roster would ever be a star. Well, Wing would try and do something about that right away, and that was go after Mike Tyson. This was actually Kazuyoshi Osako's idea as he wanted Wing to go the martial arts route as he had already brought in some wrestlers with martial arts background for the roster, and Osako said that he'd be getting Coca-Cola as a sponsor for Wing and that would help him be able to bring in Mike Tyson, as Coke was also sponsoring Tyson at the time. But Ibaragi laughs when hearing about that story now, as Osaka was just in a dream world, as they were never going to get Coke as a sponsor, let alone Mike Tyson. The first show for Wing would take place on August 7th, 1991 at Corrigan Hall, but that was not originally scheduled. Ibaragi had been trying to get the promotion booked there in August, but every day was already booked with something else. So they were planning on running other shows to be their first set of shows instead when Corrigan Hall called them back and let them know another group had canceled and now there was an opening for August 7th with Ibaragi gladly accepting it even though it was on a Wednesday night. Having their first show at Corgan Hall, which was the mecca of martial arts, would give credibility to Wing right away. This roster was all over the place, though. You had Das Karas and Fishman as luchadors. You had the Headhunters, who were these green, young Puerto Rican boys. You had the great Wojo, who they brought in without ever actually having seen. Then you had the Karate Guys brought in by Asako. Then you had Mr. Pogo, who was the top guy but a heel, and then throw in Gypsy Joe in there as well. Ibaragi would compare this show to a convenience store where it has everything, like martial arts, death matches, lucha, and women's, but a convenience store doesn't carry A-brand supplies, and this promotion had every B-grade item that there was. In a way, Wing was what FMW started out before FMW just became all about Onita. They also wanted to have an American style to them as well, kind of like WWF, and bring in Billy Anderson to be the ring announcer and do the ring introductions in English for the promotion. That's what Ibaragi wanted, at least. Whereas you have Osaku, who just wanted a martial arts promotion, as he brought in guys like Akatoshi Saito, Koshihira Kimura, and Hideki Osaka to do karate and UWF-style submission matches. So this promotion, at this point, has a complete identity crisis. They didn't end up getting Billy Anderson as he had just signed with FMW, so then they thought to bring in a woman ring announcer, which is what All Japan Women's was doing, so they brought in Yukiko Goto to be the ring announcer, and then they ended up getting an old FMW referee, and they now have themselves a promotion. They would announce the August 7, 1991 Corrigan Hall show a month prior, and although it would sell out, it would pretty much take the entire month of tickets being on sale for it to eventually sell out. They would also try and fill out the car by bringing in guys like Masayoshi Motegi, who had an amateur wrestling background, Masaru Toye, who had been abroad in Calgary for many years, and Yukihiro Kanamura, who had been with Pioneer Sensei before it closed down, and he had joined up a Masashi Ayagi's karate organization as a wrestler, which had ties with Osako, as he would end up getting brought in to help fill the cards out. As Kanamura would be pretty much a no-name rookie at this point. 
Iyagi pretty much had custody of Kanemura, but he didn't ask for a cut of Kanemura's profits with Wing, so Kanemura always thought highly of him for getting his first real break in pro wrestling. None of these wrestlers would stand out on this show, though, as the only ones that would would be the Headhunters, who were not as big as they would be best known for being, but were still considered pretty big at the time. And then Headhunter A would hit a moonsault in his match, and they would become stars of the promotion. Which actually came after the match itself, as the match was so bad that the crowd was booing at Lally, so to settle them down, he would deliver that moonsault after the match and act like it was the actual finish instead. Das Karras and Gypsy Joe were in the next two matches, and because they were legends, the fans were just happy to see them. Then the next one would be the great Wojo taking on Hideki Osaka, and it would be way too mat-based of a match, and it would be boring, and the fans would be booing once again at the end. This also helped prove that the fans really just wanted to see wrestling over martial arts. So, you have a fan base that wanted wrestling, but you have a big financial contributor in Osaku who wants this promotion to be martial arts. And he also is claiming these outrageous things like Mike Tyson's going to show up after this event. And telling everyone that Wing's going to run Budokan Hall in April 1992, which was never going to happen. Then you had the main event, which was the Karate Brothers of Mitsuturu Takuda, Koshihira Kimura, and Akitoshi Saito taking on Mr. Pogo, Steve Collins, and their mystery partner, which would be revealed as TNT, which would get a big reaction from the fans as they were happy to see him as he was known for working New Japan and later would go on to work WWF as Savio Vega. This match was frustrating for the Karate Brothers, though, because here they are, promised by Osako that they're going to be in martial arts matches, which is where their training comes from, and right Right away they're put in a wrestling match with wrestlers and they're getting chairs thrown at them and they felt like they were guinea pigs here as they pretty much had their baptism into pro wrestling right away. On top of that, even though they were having wrestling matches, the original ring used for this promotion was a martial arts ring, so there was no give to it like a wrestling ring, so everybody was hurting after this show. Saito would look like the star of the match, although Takuda was positioned to be the ace of the promotion because he was the first one to join, so he would get the win over Steve Collins despite not looking impressive in the match. After this show, though, they begin running a tour just a couple days later. Problem was, though, that in 1991, with no internet, no one outside Tokyo knew anything about this promotion, and because the show took place on a Wednesday, it was another eight days before the magazines would be released to have any information about it. Then when the magazines finally did come out, the first ever G1 was taking place at this time, so the show barely got any coverage as a result anyway. So everyone that attended these next set of shows pretty much just went in blindly having no real idea what Wing was at this point. If that Corrigan Hall show had not been added, these shows would have been the first set of Wing shows and they would have been a total disaster as there were barely any fans, nobody knew who anybody was, nobody got any reaction, and they were just bad boring shows that no one cared about which was almost the start of the promotion. One of the house shows did end up having Das Karas take on the Fishman, which would have gained some interest in bringing in some fans since they were known, but Wing didn't even promote this match ahead of time anywhere, so no one going to it was going to know it was going to happen, so Wing was at fault for some of this as well. The first weekend there was already issues as well as Akitoshi Saito, who was obviously the best fighter of the Karate Brothers, was getting frustrated that he was not pushed as the ace instead of Mitsuturu Takuda, who was clearly not as good as him, but because he was the first one to join Wing, he was the ace. Saito didn't want to say anything as he felt like him complaining would break up the group and Wing needed all three of them, but then he overheard Koshihira Kimura asking the reporters why they were acting like Saito was the ace instead of him as he felt like he was the best of the three. So many of the core Wing guys who were young were not even fully trained as well as Wing didn't have a dojo. So at the beginning they would set up the ring and Ryo Miyaki who had trained under Tarzan Goto in FMW, Masaru Toye who had trained under Mr. Hito in Calgary helped train the young wrestlers with Gypsy Joe coming in and training the shoot techniques. In case someone ever tried to shoot on them, he taught them how to pull an eyeball out just in case. The next month, Wing would get their first break through Wally Yamaguchi, as they would get a studio show tape for Chance Forum on the Space Vision Network that is now known as Gower Sports. 
They would set up the show at the JCTV studio with the crowd being brought in to tape a show to air on cable TV, which FNW had specials air on the network, but they never actually had a wrestling show air on cable television. They wouldn't think it was that big of a deal, though, as it wouldn't be for the Tokyo audience, but during their house shows that month, there would be more fans than the previous month, with so many of them saying that they saw Wing on TV, and that's what made them come to the show. The next tour, they would bring in the likes of Eddie Gilbert, Danny Davis, and Mitsuhiro Matsunaga for the first time. Matsunaga at that point really wanted to return back to FMW, but because of loyalty to Ayagi, who had a business relationship breakdown with Onita, he couldn't. So he c would join Wing as they had ties through Ayagi. Ibaragi was not that high on Matsunaga though, even though Matsunaga was part of the first barbed wire deathmatch in FMW, him joining Wing was just like a tryout to try and prove that he was actually good enough to work for Wing. The third tour in October 1991 was pretty much the final nail in the Ibaragi Asako working relationship with two different mindsets for the promotion. Ibaragi was going to bring in a bunch of Lucha Libre wrestlers, and Osako would not like this. It was one thing to be doing pro wrestling on the same cards as martial arts matches, but to be putting on Lucha Libre matches, which was the exact opposite of the serious shoot style martial arts matches that Osako wanted the promotion to be based around, would be the end of their relationship. Ibaragi and Tayo would end up being fired by Osako, and the wing promotion would turn into the WMA promotion, World Martial Arts. They would plan to run their first show on December 26, 1991 at Corrigan Hall, and then begin touring in 1992. Ibaragi and Tayo would, on the other hand, would begin working on starting their own promotion just, and just calling it Wing. At first it would be thought by the wrestlers that everyone could compete for both promotions, but then Osako's group would go, if you work for Ibaragi's group, you can't work for ours. So the wrestlers would go with Ibaragi, and the martial artists would go with Osako. Matsunaga and Kanemura, despite coming in from Ayagi's karate group, would prefer to go the wrestling route and would choose Ibaragi's wing. Akatoshi Saito, being a karate fighter, would choose Osako's promotion, as well as Hideki Osaka, who would be asked by Kanemura and Matsunaga to join Ibaragi's wing wrestling promotion, but Hosaka had been Mr. Pogo's young boy while in the old wing, and he had a bad experience and just wanted to get away from Pogo, who would be joining Ibaragi's promotion. So Hosaka would join Osako's WMA instead. There would also be a block for Matsunaga being able to work for the new Ibaragi wing promotion by Masashi Ayagi, who had a working relationship with Osako. So Matsunaga would not be allowed to wrestle on the first Corrigan Hall show for Ibaragi's group, although he they would let Kanemura work the show as Ayagi didn't really care about what Kanemura did like he did with Matsunaga since Matsunaga had been a higher up in Ayagi's karate group so Matsunaga would have to watch the show from the stands with the intention of joining the promotion sooner rather than later. Ibaragi felt like he had to make sure this first wing show at Corrigan Hall would be a success, even if it meant losing money, and so he would get in touch with Mil Mascaris to bring him over. Problem was that someone in Osako's group had gotten Mascaris' number and told him that the wing show was cancelled. So Ibaragi would end up having to fly to Mexico to convince Mascaris in person that the show was not cancelled, and he would pay him $10,000 up front for one show, which right there would not make this show profitable, but Ibaragi Ibaragi saw it as a long-term investment in getting the new wing promotion off on the right foot. Ultimately, Osaka's WMA promotion would never actually end up running a show, and those that sided with that group over wing like Akatoshi Saito, Hideki Osaka, and Koshihira Kimura would end up finding new homes elsewhere. Ibaragi would also reach out to his friend Rossi Ogawa, who worked for the All Japan Women's promotion as their PR guy, to get the All Japan Women's wrestlers at this Corrigan Hall show, with Minami Toyota appearing on the card. Toyota cared so little about the men's pro wrestling, though, that she didn't know one person on the show, including not knowing who Mil Mascaris was. The Wing and All Japan women's working relationship would also lead to Kanemura and Mio Nakamihakawa beginning a, to secretly date, and when it would be found out that they were in a relationship, that would end the working relationship between Wing and All Japan women's for several months until Wing's biggest show ever in August 1992. This first show with Mil Mascaris would be a big success, and even though this wing promotion was actually a new promotion, and WMA was actually connected to the original wing, with WMA never actually running a show, everyone would associate this wing with the original old wing instead. 
so Wing knew they needed to make a splash in some way. They were a poor promotion with really no notoriety, as the old Wing really didn't light the world on fire, and the only thing this Wing promotion had done was overpay to bring in Mil Mascaris. So they decided they needed to do something, but didn't want to spend any money on it as well. So they came up with the idea of having a wrestler jump off the balcony of Corrigan Hall, something that had never been done before. They decided that the wrestler that was going to do that was going to be Iceman, who was Ricky Santana. Well, the day of the show, Santana went up to the balcony of Corrigan before the show started and saw how high it was and was like, nope, I'm not doing that. So Matsunaga hears there's an opening and begins to beg Ibaragi, who again is not high on Matsunaga, to let him do it. Even though Matsunaga himself is scared of heights, he gets the okay from Ibaragi to do it during his match, and he jumps off the balcony onto the headhunters, which at first the fans don't even realize what had happened, but when they do realize it, they begin to pop huge for Matsunaga, and this becomes a big deal as Matsunaga gets to become Mr. Danger for it, and he begins to be pushed as one of the top guys and it gets a lot of attention from the hardcore fans that became known as the wing freaks then the next week matsunaga did a spot where he jumped off from the top of a cage onto pogo during a gypsy joe mr pogo cage match which wing is getting some notoriety now as it was the first show talked about in the magazines that week matsunaga is starting to get some attention as the hardcore people's champion and so for the next show at corgan hall they book matsunaga versus mr pogo in the first scramble bunkhouse death match where a barbed wire bat would be put in the middle of the ring and there would be a countdown to get it FMW, when it started, kind of had this indie sleaze feeling to it, but then Onita became a big star, and Megumi Kudo began to get a lot of attention, and that indie sleaze feel kind of went away after a year or so. Wing was now recapturing the indie sleaze feel, and there was a fan base to it. Akira Maeda, when seeing what Wing was doing, called it trash, and that probably actually helped appeal to a certain number of people even more. Matsunaga and Pogo ended up having an amazing match, which Matsunaga would end up feeling like it was the best match of his career, as the fans were going wild in it, and it was just a month ago that Matsunaga was making his name by doing a dive off the balcony of Corrigan Hall, and now, in this match, the ending spot saw Mr. Pogo blow a fireball at Matsunaga's head. Matsunaga and Pogo were now the two top wrestlers in the promotion and this match pretty much got rid of the negative reputation of the original wing as this was now the direction that the wing was going to be going. Pogo was not happy though being lined up with Matsunaga as Matsunaga really had no history whereas Pogo was a 20 year veteran who had been feuding with Onita the previous year but regardless these two were now the stars of the promotion. The only problem is, though, that Matsunaga broke a bone in his foot during the match and would be out for a couple months, unable to walk for a while. Then after that Corrigan Hall show, they planned on doing a ladder match on the last show of the tour in March in Shizuoka. This would be four months prior to the Bret Hart Shawn Michaels having their ladder match in July 1992 in WWF, as Ibaragi had a magazine about different gimmick matches that took place in North America throughout the 70s. And he didn't say what territory that used it, but he remembers seeing it and wanted to do it for this show. Problem was, they couldn't get it set up right to have a big ladder, and so instead they would have a gondola scaffold match between Miguel Perez and Iceman Ricky Santana. Problem with that match was that there was no second level of seats, so everybody in the building had to watch the match while looking up, which the fans that paid the most to be at ringside were not even able to see anything at all. Then, Miguel Perez, when he was falling off, had to hang on by his fingers to prevent as far as a fall as possible, so when he did fall off the scaffold, it didn't really stand out compared to the Matsunaga balcony dive. Then in April 1992, they would bring in Kevin Sullivan, who had worked for FMW back in January, a part of the Sheik's Army. And when Sullivan appeared in Wing, he would be announced as still a member of the Sheik's Army in Wing. Well, FMW finds out about this, and they call Ibaragi up. And Ibaragi is just like, oh, I'm sorry, somebody screwed up. It won't happen again. But this makes him also realize that FMW must care about Wing to make that call. With Matsunaga out, it would be Kanemura that would be turned to the top face for the promotion in the meantime. Kanemura really didn't have that much experience, though, as he was still being trained before the shows would start, then go out there and face Mr. Pogo and Kevin Sullivan in the top matches on the card. With Matsunaga being out, Kanemura really just became the top babyface of the promotion for the time being, and he didn't even actually like doing death matches at first, but he felt like he had no choice as that's what Wing was. So he knew he needed to put his body on the line every time. 
Another person given a shot was Jason the Terrible. Rafael Rodriguez was a green boy from Puerto Rico brought in by Victor Quinones, and Mr. Pogo, who had seen the Halloween movie while in America, had suggested his gimmick be that he be Michael Myers, where he plays this monster that keeps getting up no matter how much you try and kill him. Well, that would eventually turn into him doing a Jason gimmick from Friday the 13th instead, and he would have a coffin match with Mr. Pogo in May, which would be about six months before WWF had done it with The Undertaker and Kamala. The coffin they used would actually be a real coffin that they brought in from a funeral home. Pogo would win the match, but Jason would come away becoming a top guy for his performance in the match. Also another note is that Wing had planned on doing a tournament in April to decide who would face Mr. Pogo in a fire death match in August. Well, the winner was going to be Matsunaga, but he ended up getting hurt, so they ended up having Kevin Sullivan win the tournament instead. And then when Matsunaga came back in July, they had a second tournament with Matsunaga winning that one, and then he would defeat Sullivan the next day to establish Matsunaga as the man to face Pogo in the biggest Wing match in history in just nine days. So Wing now has a lot of momentum going into what would be their biggest show ever. Right away when Matsunaga was announced, the advance tickets would start selling better than ever before. Then the tickets the day of the show would sell out and they would draw a legit 5,000 plus fans for this show. All the attention was on them, and there was some worry as it started raining during the women's match on this show. But it cleared up right before the fire match between Pogo and Matsunaga, and then the match sucked. Matsunaga claims that Pogo had been hung over earlier in the day as he had been drinking the night before and just didn't want to do anything as Matsunaga obviously wanted this match to be good. Pogo was upset that he was losing to a guy with three years experience and was pretty much giving Matsunaga his top spot in the company since Pogo was turning face afterwards and he ended up only agreeing to lose via roll up which this for a death match was supposed to settle everything and that was going to be a huge letdown. Pogo pretty much sabotaged himself, Matsunaga, and Wing as all eyes were on them for the first time and everyone came away disappointed. It did get Matsunaga on the cover of the magazines that week for the first time, but the reviews were negative, pretty much saying that Wing wasn't ready for the big time. But there was still some interest because of all the momentum and the next big show they did at Kawasaki City Gym had a Mil Mascaris vs. Kinect match. However, this show upset fans because usually every show has a 10 minute break before the final two matches. But this building was hot, no air conditioning, and the break was over 20 minutes. So the fans were all annoyed and apparently it was because backstage Pogo and Matsunaga were yelling and arguing with each other, still being upset over the fire death match. So even though Wing has the most attention it ever has, and they were just coming off having the most successful shows they'd ever done, the business strategy of making money was not good. They spent too much money bringing in foreigners like Mil Mascaris and Kenak, paying for their hotels and all that, even though they had this momentum that was only transferring to good shows in the Tokyo or Osaka area. Even house shows outside those areas were financial losses, and fans in rural areas weren't coming to see these shows, so the promotion was never not losing money, no matter the fact that they were at their popularity peak. Wing felt like they had to use foreigners, though, or else the shows would have no chance of ever doing well. Then Wing would bring in Shoji Nakamaki, and I talked about that whole story of him leaving FNW under shady conditions in the Tarzan Goto episode. Well, the Wing fan base did not like how this guy, who was a celebrity and an undercard guy in FMW, had came into Wing, and now he's being pushed as this top guy. So they are booing the hell out of him in his first match against Kanemura. They did an angle where Kanemura just keeps knocking him down, but Nakamaki just keeps getting up, trying to get sympathy. But the Wing fans would have none of it, and would continue to boo Nakamaki, and it took him a while to finally be accepted by the fan base. So at this point, Matsunaga is the full-on ace of Wing, but he has a reputation that just because Wing isn't as big as FMW, and Onita was doing deathmatches first, that Matsunaga was a copy of Onita. So Matsunaga, who respects Onita, as he liked working for him those first couple of months when he was in FMW, wants to do a deathmatch that Onita would never do and get away from the Onita ripoff stigma by doing a Needles deathmatch. Now, this had been done before in 1976 between Antonio Inoki and Yumono Ueda, but no one actually had fallen into the needles. But ticket sales for this show were not doing well at all, as people just thought it would be like Inoki versus Ueda, where they just teased that someone would fall into the needles. So Wing would announce that the only way to win the match is to knock your opponent into the nail board so someone will have to fall into them. 
So Leatherface ends up being Matsunaga's opponent, and he ends up taking Matsunaga's knee brace off and hits him with it, knocking Matsunaga into the nail boards to get the win. So Matsunaga is at home the next day and goes, I can't go outside because I have to sell that I was just dropped onto nails yesterday. And you don't want random people seeing you walk around just fine the next day. Well, a couple hours into the day, and Matsunaga's just sitting at home, and he goes, I need to get some food. So he goes, well, no one's going to recognize me anyway, so let me just go out and get something. And he walks out and walks by a school, and all these kids are outside playing, and they see him and go, Mr. Danger! And all the kids just come up to Matsunaga, and he's just like, how do you know who I am? Wing isn't just on regular TV, so these kids aren't just watching him. And one kid goes, my dad reads wrestling magazines and I saw you. And another kid goes, I saw you on the cover of the wrestling magazine for the fire match at the convenience store. So Matsunaga doesn't want to repeat of this again, so he starts taking taxis whenever he wants to go somewhere. Well, taxis are expensive, and he's only making about 1800 a month, and he asks to get a raise, which he ends up getting a raise to $2,250 a month, but that's still only $27,000 a year, to where riding a taxi would actually hurt financially, and he can't afford a car with it. And riding on the subway with everyone else will kill his image to the fans that would see him. Then there would be a rematch of Matsunaga vs. Leatherface in a spike nail death match, which would take place on May 5th, 1993, the same day as Onita vs. Terry Funk in the exploding ring death match at Kawasaki. The feeling that day was that Wing was wasting money making a match on a day that they weren't going to get anyone other than the hardcore Wing freaks to attend the show, as everyone else was going to be at Kawasaki Stadium. Even all the deathmatch indie reporters chose to report on Onita vs. Funk, with only one New Japan reporter being assigned to cover the wing match. Wing tried to be like, hey, you can come to our day show, and then afterwards make it to the night show at Kawasaki Stadium and see Onita vs. Funk. But then FNW started the show during the day also, and once they realized it would be impossible to see both, they quit saying that, and the fans would have to choose which one they were going to see. Matsunaga would get his revenge on Leatherface this time and knock him into the nails to even it up. This would set up a match the following month at Corrigan Hall where they would announce a Moonlight Darkness Lights Out Death Match. This would be the first time done in Japan and tickets would sell really well as they would sell out in advance for this show, which was great for Wing because usually to draw well in a death match, you gotta pay extra for the death match item that helped draw the show. But for this show, with it being a lights out match, all you had to do was turn off the lights. Matsunaga wasn't sure about the match where the fans couldn't see, but he knew as long as he was wrestling Leatherface, it was going to be a good, interesting match regardless. Then that day, Leatherface didn't show up. Wing would end up just using Freddy Krueger, feeling like no one's going to see who Matsunaga's fighting anyway, although it would have been cool to see the chainsaw sparks from Leatherface in the dark that day. The match was still considered a success despite the main event change as Freddy and the heels would end up hanging Matsunaga up with a chain from the balcony of Corrigan Hall which shocked everyone and no one ended up complaining about Leatherface not wrestling that day. Leatherface the night before the show had been arrested for assault after getting into a fight in the streets of Roppongi late at night after Mike Lazansky who had gotten into words with someone and Leatherface decided to end the fight right there with his fist knocking the guy out cold. Once he woke up though he would end up going to the police and Leatherface would end up being arrested and sent to a detention center. It was not known when he would come back, as the wrestlers were expecting his return, although Wing would end up closing down by the time he would finally get out. This would just be the beginning of losing wrestlers, though, as just a week later, Mr. Pogo would end up showing up in FMW. Pogo, being the top star, wanted a pay raise, but asked to be vice president of the company instead to make his extra money through that. Well, Wing was not making money, so Pogo, as vice president, did not make any extra money being the vice president of the company when Onita ended up calling him and offering him big money to leave Wing and come back to FMW, and Pogo took it and he was gone. So Pogo was making $4,000 a month, and Matsunaga at this point is making $2,250 a month. 
Victor Quinones told Ibaragi that Matsunaga, being the top star of the promotion, should make Mr. Pogo's $4,000 now, with him being gone. And Matsunaga, of course, hears that talk of him possibly getting a good size raise with him being the biggest star with Pogo gone. Well, Matsunaga's next paycheck goes up about $250 to $2,500, which Matsunaga thinks he got a little bit of a raise, at least as being the top star. Well, then it turns out, whoops, Ibaragi had screwed up and tells him that it was an error and he's going to have to deduct $250 out of his next paycheck, so he's just going to make $2,000 next time. And that really annoyed Matsunaga after hearing that. Then Matsunaga gets a call from Onita, who tells him that he would pay him $10,000 a month if he just stops showing up in Wing and eventually appears in FMW, which Matsunaga would accept. Matsunaga, though, would end up working the next two Wing shows, the first two of the tour, as those were sponsored events, and him no-showing those would just hurt the promoters and not Ibaragi. The third event on that tour, though, would be a Corrigan Hall show, and that's when he would no-show with him leaving Wing, which would be official, and he would end up getting $300 paid from FNW just for no-showing that event. All the wing wrestlers were actually understandable of Matsunaga leaving for FNW, except Kanemura, who had loyalty to Ibaraki and didn't like Matsunaga working the first two wing shows of the tour. And then as soon as the Corrigan Hall Ibaraki show takes place, he hides. Now, Kanemura was also really pissed off at Pogo for leaving as well. So he just hates these top guys selling out the promotion that he loves. So Wing is now in a bad position. They've lost their two top stars, and with Matsunaga leaving, many fans felt that Wing could no longer do exciting Wing death matches, and you're never going to see those anymore. Wing was dealing with another issue, though. They had just done a Matsunaga vs. Freddy Krueger fire death match one year to the day of the Matsunaga Pogo fire death match. This match was never broadcasted on video, though, so it's not remembered that well. Well, this was a sponsor show, meaning someone else was supposed to pay Wing to ha allow their wrestlers wrestle on the event. Well, because Wing was kind of in a tough position, they agreed to let the sponsor pay them after the show was over. Well, that sponsor ended up just leaving them high and dry and didn't give them a cent. So Wing got no money from this show, and as a result, they didn't end up paying the vendor that had set up the fire death match. So now Wing's name is nothing to the people that would help set up and organize a fire death match like they had been doing. So you would think with a bad reputation and no Matsunaga, the days of the crazy death matches are over, right? Nope. Ibaragi decides to do a fire death match between Kanemura and Nakamaki versus Jado and Ghetto with one day's notice on October 31st, 1993, with the rest of the wing office and the wrestlers finding out about the match stipulation the day before in the newspaper. So the office was not happy with Ibaragi, as the other fire death matches had been built up. This was literally just thrown together at the last minute. Kanemura didn't like it also, but he knew he had to give his body, as he was kind of the top guy in the promotion now, as the fans were just never going to accept Nakamaki. Even though they didn't hate him anymore, they just couldn't accept him as the top guy, and this pretty much meant that Kanemura was the top guy as a result. So with no vendor willing to set up the fire match like before, Wing has to do it like how FMW did it in 1992 by putting kerosene in the ropes and then doing torches, which copying the way FMW did it a year prior and what happened to them is not ideal. Then it was really windy that night, which isn't good for fire, and they ended up having trash and dead leaves being blown into the ring, which either of those could have easily caught on fire during the match. Then, Wing goes into the show without having any fire extinguishers, and their plan is just to pour a bucket of water into the ring in case any of the fire drops down onto the mat, with no flame being able to burn the mat during the match. Problem was, they had an old lady who Wing did stuff like this before, uh, put one bucket of water outside the ring and another bucket of kerosene outside the ring. It was dark that night, though, and when they went to use the bucket of kerosene for the ropes to keep the fires on the barbed wire going, they noticed that they were putting water on it, which meant the old lady had mixed up the buckets and they had poured kerosene on the mat instead of the water. Also, just to make things worse, when Kanemura was heading to the ring, he wanted to wash his face before the match. So he washed his face with the bucket next to the ring, but it was the bucket with the kerosene. So he went into the match with kerosene on his face. 
Then the big spot, which was Jado's idea of him powerbombing Kanemura onto the fire, not knowing he already had kerosene on his body from trying to wash his face, and that the ring was covered all over with kerosene. So when Kanemura was powerbombed into the fire, it just became this huge fireball all over Kanemura's back. Kanemura would instinctively try and get the fire out, but it would burn on his back for nearly 20 seconds. The referee would call the match with Jado and Ghetto winning and going, We're the new Mr. Danger! But everyone would be looking at Kanemura the whole time. Kanemura's back had already began to peel off as 75% of his back had been burnt. An ambulance would be called right away. Kanemura would compose himself and get back into the ring and actually cut a promo with the ambulance symbol being seen in the background from afar, which was a cool visual as Kanemura would be transported to the hospital and be the new number one face of the promotion. Problem was, he was going to be out for a couple months due to these burns. Kanemura would also beg the photographers to take pictures of his back so they could be seen in the magazines across Japan as he knew this could be an advertisement for Wink. Then the last real big talked about story from the original Wing would come a month later, when Freddy Krueger and the Boogeyman would take off their masks to reveal Eddie and Doug Gilbert. They were actually on opposite teams as Rick Patterson, now being the new Leatherface, was going up against Crypt Keeper outside the ring as Boogie would end up sunset flipping Freddy Krueger and get the win in just 13 seconds to end this match. Freddy would then get on the mic and take off his mask and reveal to be Doug Gilbert as Eddie would then take off his boogeyman mask. Doug would call out Ibaragi and say that Wing was a shitty promotion and they would pledge their allegiance to Giant Baba's All Japan. Ibaragi, when asked about that, said he felt like the Gilberts were just drugged up on sleeping pills as Victor Quinones' quote-unquote sleeping pills had been stolen that week. Although, I did want to make note that I talked to Rick Patterson, the second Leatherface, about this, and he had been around them all that week and ha was in the match with them that day, and he says that he does not believe any drug or sleeping pill thing that Ibaragi says was true. What's noted is that while they were on tour, someone with All Japan had came up to them and said, you know, if you join All Japan, you'd be making this much, and told them a number. So that made them do what they did. But All Japan didn't really want to steal them away from Wing, and after they did what they did in Wing, there was no way that Giant Baba would ever use them because of how they left Wing. So with no Pogo, no Matsunaga, and now no Kanemura, it was just a disastrous time for Wing. Fans wouldn't accept Nakamaki. Jado and Ghetto actually became the aces of the promotion during this time, despite being heels. The cards weren't fresh. They were losing fans. Really, Matsunaga leaving was kind of the end, as he was the true ace of the promotion. And even Matsunaga said he felt like a war criminal leaving Wing to join FMW, which, yeah, he made a lot more money, but he was more miserable pretty much the entire time throughout FMW, and he always considered himself a Wing wrestler, which the FMW office did as well pretty much. Then Jado and Ghetto announced that they would be leaving to join the war promotion, and then four days later, Kanemura would finally make his comeback, although after just being out for three months, he was really not ready at all. And he would end up defeating Hito, who had been a part of the Jado Ghetto group, with Hito leaving the promotion after that match. Then, they would hold one more tour in March 1994, which would be pretty much a nothing tour. It wouldn't be videotaped, there wasn't any brawling at Corrigan Hall, just straight wrestling throughout. It didn't look like Wing. Afterwards, Ibaragi would announce that they would take a break for a month and come back in May 1994 with Kevin Sullivan on the tour. And then they would hold another fire death match in August 1994 with Kanemura competing in it. Ibaragi would then end up being told by Wally Yamaguchi and Victor Quinones he needed to end Wing now so everyone could just transfer to the new promotion that was starting up called IWA Japan. About a year afterwards, Ibaragi would bring back the wing name in 1995, but since all the Japanese wrestlers were now either in FMW or IWA Japan, he would just have Puerto Rican wrestlers and bring in ECW wrestlers, but after about two months of shows, he couldn't afford to keep it going with paying all the airline tickets. Then he would bring wing back in summer of 1997, and this time he would just work with a triple A and bring in Mexican wrestlers, and the group again would only make it a couple of months. Then the big one would be in 2001, as he would bring in a bunch of the wrestlers known for Wing, like Matsunaga and Pogo, and he would have a rematch of Kanemura and Nakamaki against Jado and Ghetto, and this would be a successful reunion show, to where it would seem like they could continue doing this every couple of months, and they would run another show at Corrigan Hall in August 2001, with Matsunaga taking on Freddy Krueger in a rematch of the Lights Out match they had in 93, and then they would have another show in October 2001, 
2001, and it would be eh. And then Ibaragi would run a show at Corrigan Hall in December 2001, and it would be a total disaster. Essentially, Ibaragi would try and run a wrestling show without any money. He would be about $4,000 short to rent Corrigan Hall, and he would have to sign an agreement with them that he would pay them back throughout time. Then Ibaragi had to meet with the company that he was supposed to pay for the ring. Having no money, he ends up being in this meeting for a while before the show while all the wrestlers were waiting for him to get paid to wrestle. He wouldn't end up coming out before the time of the start of the show, so the wrestlers would decide to go out and wrestle without having been paid. Then Tobihiko Hama and Yoshia before the show were like, well, if we're not getting paid by Ibaragi, then we're taking these winged VHS tapes that were supposed to be for sale to the fans before the show and try and make money selling those instead of being paid by Ibaragi. This show would start and Ibaragi had also not done a good job promoting it and the building would look pretty much empty as they would announce 444 fans for it, meaning there was even less fans than that as this building, there's barely anyone there. Ibaragi would finally meet with the wrestlers at 10.30 that night after the show had ended, but Corrigan Hall had already closed, so they all had to meet with him out in the parking lot of Corrigan. And so they all meet with him, and Ibaragi goes, I have no money, but I promise you, as soon as I get the money, I'm going to transfer it to you at a later date. And of course, the wrestlers would never end up seeing that money, and Ibaragi would never be allowed to run Corrigan Hall after this. Ibaragi would come back and begin promoting again in 2009 for another wing reunion at the smaller Shinkiba First Ring building, with Mr. Pogo and his protege Toru, better known as Magnitude Kishiwata, taking on Kanemura and Hito, with Pogo blowing fire at Kanemura and Hito and getting the win over them. This would be a successful reunion show again, which would make Ibaragi feel like he could continue to book them. And that would go on until April 2010, when All Japan would end up calling the Yakuza on him. Which, if you want to know that full story, go back and watch my History of FNW Volume 38 video, which I talk about the year 2010 in it for the full story. But the Yakuza would make it to where Ibaragi would never be able to promote another wing wrestling show again. So now Ibaragi is doing reunion talk events with other former wing wrestlers and FMW wrestlers going over stories. And then he also has his own wing YouTube channel where he talks about specific wing stories as well of the promotion that only lasted originally a little over two years, but it's still remembered so well despite its many faults, most of them because of Ibaragi 30 years later. And that is it for today. If you want to check out more, please go to my website, bahufmw.com or fmwwrestling.us, where I have FMW biographies, results, news over the last 20 plus years, as well as FMW Wing and many other Japanese wrestling promotions, DVDs, MP4s, and ISOs for sale. Also, I'm working on translating a bunch of Japanese wrestling books here in the near future and starting a Patreon where you'll be able to read them, which hopefully will be ready here in the next couple months. Also, if you search Brett FMW on YouTube, you can find all the previous FMW Stories episodes, as well as the entire History of FMW series, as well as much more. And if you want to just listen to these episodes on your phone, just search History of FMW on Stitcher, Apple, or any of the other podcast sites, and you'll be able to find it. And that is pretty much it. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for, if not for shedding? Uh -huh.